Good morning. Thank you, Eric. I am absolutely thrilled and delighted to be part of SUBEX's user conference and going back to my roots in the telco industry. As a futurist, I spend a lot of my time going into research labs and startups to see the things that are being worked on and that are over the horizon. I love doing this because I get to talk to some really cool people about really cool projects. Last week, I was talking to a scientist in the UK who's at the University of Leeds and working in their robotics innovation laboratories. They're working on a fleet of tiny repair and exploration robots that will autonomously repair city infrastructure. Imagine living in a city where there are no potholes because robots have gone out and fixed little tiny potholes before they get big at the first sign when they're still tiny. The robots that this group is working on will also be launched into utility pipes where they will present live information about things that are going on deep underneath the ground. Some of the ideas that they have for building these robots are to use origami type of structures and robots that are able to fold up and take different shapes. They're also looking at robots that are actually swarm bots, swarms of tiny little robots that are able to act collectively like a hive and attach and detach themselves into different shapes, like transformer toys made real. The team that is working on this has already launched exploration robots that have explored the Great Pyramid of Giza. The robots that they've designed have gone into air shafts in the pyramids and uncovered writing that was unseen by human eyes for thousands of years. The things that are being worked on right now will fundamentally change our world in ways that will be hard to even imagine. In 10 years, our world is going to look so different than it does today. And in 20 years, it's going to look like it's straight out of a science fiction movie. Now, there are so many opportunities and so many impacts for the kinds of disruption that these emerging technologies will have. But what strikes me about the telco industry is that networks are the glue that is holding together all of these emerging technologies. There are so many opportunities for those of you that are in the network business, but there are also risks if you don't have agility to be able to seize these opportunities or you don't invest in the appropriate capacity in your networks. You need to look over the horizon at where the opportunities are because fleetness is going to be increasingly important. So let's go for a little ride into the future. One of the first areas that we will see emerging technologies impact people's daily lives is in the way that we interact with our environment. So you would all be familiar with wearables, things like Fitbit or smartwatches that are able to measure your breathing rate or your heart rate and your sleep patterns and a range of other things. Wearables are about to get a whole lot more intimate. At UC Berkeley, they've designed prototype sensor-based wearables that are able to do molecular-based analysis from the sweat on your body. A lot of companies are looking at wearables to use in their enterprise deployment as well for safety and occupational reasons. This kind of wearable allows you to start to get very rich biosensing data about individuals. There are a lot of applications, including very highly individualized healthcare. Another area that is really exciting is with stretchable electronics. Now, these are not even prototypes. This is commercial. There's a company in Massachusetts called MC10 that has designed these wearable sensors that basically fit on you like a Band-Aid, and they're able to measure all kinds of biometric signals, including heart information, and through Bluetooth communications, match it with an app, and then from the app, go up to a cloud and do real-time based analytics. 
Increasingly, people who have very serious health issues, like cardiac problems, will be wearing sensors that are analyzed in real time through analytics in the cloud. Network connectivity is going to be very important. And in fact, there are people that I know that use wearables where if they don't have that kind of network connectivity, they need to check themselves into a hospital because of the severity of their physical issues. It's going to get even more interesting than that. It's not just healthcare where we're going to see this whole new world of stretchable and bendable wearable technology. At MIT, they're working on something called DuoSkin, which is pictured here. It uses gold leaf as a connectivity or conductivity material, and it's transferred onto skin through water. And with DuoSkin, it can do three things. It can allow you to use your skin interface to control appliances like a touch screen on a phone. One of the first applications is controlling music. It also has output sensory capabilities that allow you to do things like change the color of these tattoos or light up LEDs. In the future, it might be able to show you a whole lot more. But most importantly, it also has wireless connectivity built right into this smart tattoo that you're putting on your skin. It has near-field communication, and you can store information in your skin as well. So one of the questions that comes to mind is, will we have mobile phones in the future? Right now, for a lot of telcos around the world, handsets are a really big revenue stream. If we start moving away from handsets, what does that mean? Well, I think we're still going to need something for the visual side of things. I don't necessarily think that we're going to use our skin to be able to replace a flat screen, although I have seen a concept wearable that does have a display that's foldable, and you can actually put it on your wrist. But let's face it, sometimes it's cold and you don't want to have your arms exposed. We will have all kinds of sensors on our bodies, but maybe we'll have a comms badge like they have in Star Trek Enterprise as the gateway back to the world. But what will we do for the visual side of things? Well, that's where an exciting technology called augmented reality comes into play. And this is starting to hit mainstream now. The visuals with augmented reality, which is also known as mixed reality, because it allows you to have a combination of real-world view with digital information superimposed on your field of vision. A couple of the leading companies in this space are Microsoft with HoloLens and also Meta 2. So what you can do wearing these glasses is to be able to look at something like this car and pull it apart and see what's inside of it. Or in the case of this helmet here, which is from a company called Dockery in California, it's a smart helmet. So it's used by workers out in the field, and it has the protection like a construction helmet would, but it also is armed with lots of cameras. So when a worker is out in the field and he or she sees a range of pipes in their field of vision, superimposed on their visual field is information about what's in each pipe, the temperature of the pipe, the pressure of gas or liquid inside of a pipe, pressure control so that you know which way to turn things. If you can imagine, there are a lot of enterprise scenarios where hands-free is good. These headsets also have microphones, so you can control what you see with your voice. You can collaborate in real time because you've got cameras where you might have someone that's an expert in maintenance in an area that you're not familiar with guiding you based on what you're actually seeing. Companies like Meta2 have a vision that our display screens, our CRTs and flat screens, might someday go away, and that instead of actually having physical hardware, they'll be floating out in front of us and will interact with a virtual keyboard. 
Going beyond this on the continuum of mixed reality is virtual reality. And with virtual reality, what you are doing is essentially emerging yourself in a world where the outside world is taken away from your view. And as you can see, I like to play around with these things. And I've got to tell you right now, these headsets are not very comfortable. In fact, I can wear them for just a couple of minutes and I'm ready to take them off. But the clarity is getting so real, and the impact that it has on you as an individual is gobsmacking. I was using an Oculus Rift um, headset a few months ago at a trade show called CBIT, and researchers from the University of Newcastle had designed this virtual reality scene where you walk up to the edge of a cliff, and then you walk over it, and you see what happens. Well, here I am in the middle of a trade show floor, and I knew that I wasn't anywhere near a cliff, but it felt so real that as I started to get to the edge of the cliff, my feet were going slower and slower, and I just did not want to walk over. And eventually, they coaxed me to do it, and my stomach went right up like I was on a roller coaster, and I was so thankful that as I was about to hit the rocks on bottom, it actually slowed. The impact that virtual reality has is unbelievable. And there are so many industries where we're going to see virtual reality be a game changer. Already, there are big companies like IKEA that are experimenting with virtual reality for their customers. This is a VR experiment that IKEA is doing in Australia. And what you do with this is you're wearing a VR headset, and you're looking at different kitchen finishes, and you can click and see what your kitchen might look like with different finishes. What's really interesting about this is the little man icon that lets you change your point of view. So instead of looking at the kitchen from whatever height you are as an individual, suddenly you can shrink down to the size of a child and see the room from a child's view, or telescope up to the point of view of a really tall person. There are a lot of companies that are investing in virtual reality experiences. Another one that's being done is a combination of eBay and Meijer, which is a department store chain, and they have designed a virtual department store for consumers to use at their home. So they have a pair of free cardboard type of VR glasses where you insert your phone into it, or you can use an expensive VR headset, and you literally can look through a select catalog of their products in virtual reality, walking around things, manipulating things, seeing what they look like, not feel yet, but what they look like. Companies like Boeing are using virtual reality to train their staff on the proper techniques to apply paint to Chinook helicopters. There are so many other companies that are getting into this space. Audi is another one. They have VR showrooms, a couple in the United States, where you decide what kind of finish you want to see your new car in, and you can literally see it and poke your head into the bonnet through there and play around. The sky is going to be the limit with virtual reality, but it's also going to have a huge impact on your networks. We're about to hit a VR tsunami because the headset prices are coming down and the clarity is getting better. We've all seen the impact of Netflix on networks. Well, virtual reality, just with HDTV um, quality, uses about four to five times the bandwidth of HDTV. And when you start thinking about 4K and 8K 360 surround, you get the picture of the kind of bandwidth that these rigs are going to generate. Now, just a few weeks ago, Google came out with a new cheap headset, the Daydream, which is similar to cardboard, but an advancement on it. You still use your mobile phone, but it's cloth covered and a lot more comfortable. Sony just came out with a VR headset for its PlayStation. The world of gaming and immersive entertainment is going to present both opportunities and challenges because especially with gaming, you're looking at real-time scenes that you're not able to cache anywhere where you can have 360-degree views. And it's not just gaming and entertainment. There are also um, early experiments with digital control of the real world through a virtual reality simulation. 
So in Israel, back in 2011, they had an experiment of a human using femto MRI to control a robot in France several thousand kilometers away. And literally, through this virtual reality experience, people were able to control robotics. And that's actually going to be a big thing in the enterprise world. Imagine being able to control a robot in a mining situation through a virtual reality. And then there are movies like Avatar or Surrogate, where people, ordinary people, start to control these real-world avatars that are robots in different places. The bandwidth and the requirement for real-time connectivity is going to be huge. Now, where is this going in the future? Well, headsets can be a bit awkward to wear. Smart contacts are what's on the horizon, probably in the five-year-plus time zone. Now, there are already patents out for smart contacts that combine both ICT, augmented reality, cameras, and biotech. So one example is, imagine that you've got a camera in your eye, and there are already patents from three companies to do this, where you just blink, and it either takes a picture or starts filming. Google, Sony, and Samsung have already applied for patents to be able to blink, start filming, and take pictures. Samsung, in their patent, has built-in video displays right into these smart contacts. Let's hope they get their QA together before they roll those out. <laughs> we don't want a galaxy repeat in our eyeballs. The biotech side, though, is really fascinating because that is one of the drivers for why people will adopt this smart contact technology. It turns out that in our tear ducts, we have a chemical called lacroglobin that allows us to do things like measure insulin levels and detect precancerous situations. There's also a lot of money being put in to autofocus lenses. So for people like me who re need reading glasses, imagine not having to ever need reading glasses because your lens is autofocus, depending on what you're looking at. And not only that, but they might have telephoto capabilities or infrared capabilities as well. And you're in a conference like this, and you see a guy or gal that you know their face, but you can't remember their name because it's been three years since you met them. Imagine how Covering in your line of sight, you've got the details about who that person is, where they're at now, from your address book or other personal stores, context-rich information. The world is going to change when these things come out. We're going to see app stores, just like the smartphone app stores, that have apps that combine biotech and ICT. And they've got built-in wireless capabilities, too. Now, right now, this is a prototype from Google. You still have bits that are opaque. But in the future, this will probably make, be made out of graphene and be totally translucent, meaning that somebody will have this smart lens in their eye, and you will not know that they have it in there. People who are early adopters will have significant advantages. Biometrics is another huge area of both opportunity and questions. So I'm talking about things like voice recognition, fingerprint recognition, facial recognition. It's going to be increasingly important in the era, in the era of hacking and for fraud detection. Barclays Bank in the UK has just rolled out a voice recognition banking system. And MasterCard is doing trials in 12 European countries with a combination of fingerprint and facial recognition technology. Now, facial recognition is so interesting because it goes beyond being able to just say, here's a static image of someone's face and they're standing nice and still and cooperating. That's cool. But where it gets fascinating is when these facial recognition systems are able to recognize faces in a crowd from CCTV cameras mounted at an angle and pick people out and figure out who they are. But it goes beyond that, too. In the world of retail, there are all kinds of applications to be able to recognize the demographics of the people either in your store or in front of your ad, and not just the demographics, but the emotions. 
Imagine digital signage that changes and provides real-time content based on the kind of people that are in front of the ad and their reactions. So if you've got a sign and you're in a supermarket, you probably want to display something different to little old ladies than you would a bunch of teenage boys. There's, a, in Australia, a company that's starting to roll out these kinds of digital signs right now. Fascinating area that combines artificial intelligence with biometrics. But what happens if a biometric database is hacked? And it doesn't have to be facial recognition, but it could be your voice print, it could be your fingerprint, it could be anything. Now, with facial recognition in particular, the bigger your database is, the more likely it is that you'll have errors in matching. But what if someone hacked into it, and instead of having a terrorist picture in the suspect list, suddenly it was your picture or mine? How would you recover from something like that, especially if they've got a predator drone that's set to put missiles at you, you know, if you're one of the suspected terrorists? Now, there are some technologies in the future that might help us recover from a hack of biometric databases. This is something that's being worked on by Bingham University. It's early experimental stage right now. It's a brain print. And what they do is they mount you with this head cap full of um, ECG signals. And of course, you know, by the time it gets commercial, you're not going to be wearing things like this. And they're showing you a series of images and monitoring your brain's reaction to this series of images. Well, it turns out that we humans, because of our unique socialization, all have unique brain prints when we see a series of images because of our own personal background. Now, the cool thing about this is if this brain print database were to be hacked, you would just record another series of images and you've recovered your identity. Whereas if someone steals your fingerprint, as what happened with the Office of Personnel Management in the United States, you're never going to get that back. You're not going to generate a new fingerprint. So it's an exciting area. The Internet of Things is really exciting, too. And when I talk about the Internet of Things, I'm talking everything from sensors on our body to sensors in our homes, in our cities, in our cars. There's so many opportunities in this area. One company in Italy, Trenitalia, is using sensors to do conditional maintenance on their trains. So they've rolled out sensors that measure pressure and temperature and all sorts of other information on their fleet of trains. And instead of just going out and doing regular maintenance just because it's week number two, they're taking inputs from this bank of sensors and using advanced analytics to do both predictive analysis of when something might break or need maintenance, as well as doing conditional-based maintenance based on the information coming back. They estimate that it will save them between 8 to 10% a year on maintenance cost. And they spend 1.3 billion euros a year on maintenance, so that's a big number. But on the other side, you can imagine what would happen if that sensor database was hacked. What if, instead of a sensor reporting back, hey, there's a problem with pressure, that information was changed to say, hey, everything's A-OK. -okay. You can imagine a real-world scenario where there'd be some very catastrophic consequences. So security is really important in the IoT space, but unfortunately, like in many other areas, it's often an afterthought. Sensor networks are going to be really, really big, and we're going to see them deployed in lots of areas, whether it's in agriculture, on bridges to measure stress and pressure, um, in trains, in buildings for fires, you name it. They're going to be out there. One of the questions that I have is what kinds of communications technologies are going to connect these sensor networks? And what kinds of cloud-based services are going to do the analytics to be able to make this information valuable in real time in a context-aware way? So there are a lot of competing protocols. It might be cell networks, 3G, 4G, 5G in a couple of years. It might be narrowband IoT or LoRa or even Sigfox.
But the question is, will it be carriers who deploy these sensor networks, or will it be some other organization? There are massive opportunities waiting to be taken advantage of. And frankly, depending on which analyst you listen to, by 2020, there'll be anywhere from 50 billion to 200 billion things connected to the Internet of Things. The cities of tomorrow are going to change in major ways. Our populations are growing. Back in 1800, only 3% of the world lived in major urban centers. By 2011, it had risen to 50%. And by 2025, according to some demographers, 70% of the world's population could live in bigger cities. So there's going to be a lot of pressure to be able to change our cities to accommodate this influx of people. And smart cities are one way that this will happen. And it's a combination, once again, of instrumenting our environment and then using advanced analytics to do really interesting things with all the data that is coming out there. There'll be all kinds of sensor networks. In Sydney, on the Sydney train system, they've just rolled out something called Mousetrap. It's a sensor that is able to sniff odors of either permanent markers or spray paint. It's meant to fight graffiti, which cost, in New South Wales, $34 million a year to fix trains and make them look nice again. The system cost about $500,000 to roll out. So when this mousetrap sensor sniffs markers, it activates a CCTV camera feed directly to police in the train office so that people can see what's going on in the train. And because the train's moving, they can actually catch the vandals in real time. Imagine a city where buses are rerouted to routes where you actually have people waiting instead of going to routes where you have nobody at a bus stop. You're going to start to see a whole range of very smart analytics. One of the other things that's happening in cities is what I call the Wi-Fi revolution. And it's happening at different paces in different parts of the world, but I'm starting to see a lot of municipalities that are rolling out free Wi-Fi. So the question might be, with all this smart city initiative happening, once again, is it carriers that will benefit from this, or will the cities be putting in their own infrastructure in isolation? And once again, what protocol might they be using? In the cities of the future, we're going to see lots of robots. I mentioned earlier some of the work being done at the University of Leeds. In my hometown of Sydney, researchers at the University of Technology Sydney and New South Wales Roads and Maritime, which is responsible for the Sydney Harbour Bridge, started a collaboration about seven years ago to try to tackle the problem of how do we safely get into these tiny infrastructure, steel, big steel um, infrastructure, but in tiny little crawl holes in a way that's safe for humans. And what the researchers came up with was a biologically inspired robot called Croc that's based on an inchworm that is 100% autonomous. It's able to navigate into the Sydney Harbour Bridge in these tiny little nooks and crannies, map it out, send it back to a geospatial system, and it will, in the future, also do automated grit blasting of these steel infrastructure projects. This isn't an experiment. There are actually two robots that live and work on the Sydney Harbour Bridge, Sandy and Rosie, and they're out there right now. We're also going to see, increasingly, the need for cities to monitor and integrate these data sets. This picture is from Rio de Janeiro. And they rolled out a whole range of sensors in support of the Olympics. And I was chatting with Karen last night. Karen, for those of you who don't know him, is the head of Subax's IoT portfolio. And we were talking about this particular project. One of the interesting things that happened here is that because they were deploying sensors in a range of different cross-departmental areas, the government departments, which had been siloed, started to talk together. But what Karen was sharing with me was the one thing they got wrong was that they didn't take into account social media and the public feedback. So if you can imagine applying an AI that's able to do natural language interpretation of things like Twitter feeds or Facebook posts, that would have actually made this smart city for the Olympics a whole lot more effective. 
Another thing that comes to me when I look at this picture is that looks an awful lot like a network operations center to me. And I think that smart city monitoring and analytics is yet another area that telcos should be interested in being a part of, especially as you can also provide the connectivity glue. We're going to see robots everywhere, and they're going to be in all different shapes and sizes, in the air, on the land, and in the sea. One of the first places that we'll see them in our cities is in the world of driverless cars, because guess what? That's actually a robot when you've got a driverless car. And we'll see them in lots of different shapes and sizes. So most of you would have probably recognized this Google prototype car that has no steering wheel or brake or um, any kind of human controls. And you might think, well, that's just Google. They're experimenting. Well, let me tell you, every car manufacturer in the world, bar none, is investing big time in autonomous driving technology. About a month or so ago, Ford announced that they're going to be rolling out commercial vehicles that are aimed at the ride-sharing market like Uber and Lyft, and these vehicles will have no steering wheel, no brake pedal, nothing, nada. They will be designed for autonomous service. This little taxi-looking thing is being trialed in the UK right now in a place called Milton-upon-Keynes. And what's interesting about this trial is that they're doing it in very highly urbanized areas, and they're about to start doing trials with real people wanting to hail taxis. Now, it's not just these little pod-like things that we're going to see. We're going to see luxury cars that have these sensor-based technologies as well. Tesla is probably the most well-known in this space with its expensive um, vehicles that have all kinds of sensors. But if I look at mainstream companies, for example, Volvo, their new S90 today, commercial, has all kinds of sensors. They're able to detect when pedestrians are about to go in front of a car or cyclists or large animals. They have technologies like lane assist that will gently nudge you back in your lane if the robot vision senses that you're straying. They have remote assist um, cruise control, where one of the things that's so annoying when you've got cruise control in is somebody is going a bit too slow in front of you and suddenly you have to hit the brake and then you put it back on and they go too fast, too slow, and you're constantly being driven nuts. This technology today, this remote assistance, does that back off, start up again without you, the human, taking care, having to do anything. And this is a commercial vehicle that's being sold now. By the time we get to 2020, we're going to see almost every vehicle in the world that's being sold in a showroom have some sort of remote pilot capabilities, which will be driverless vehicles. It's going to change everything. And it's not just the vehicles that will be on our roads. This cute little robot here is called Drew. It was designed by Domino's Enterprise, Domino Pizza, in Australia. It stands for Domino's Robotic Unit, and it's got two little containers up at the top, one for hot pizzas and one for cold drinks. And it is being navigated in semi-autonomous mode right now in Brisbane, in trials, delivering pizzas using foot paths and cyclist paths. And one of the things that Domino's is doing is that they actually did trials with customers to see their reaction to this cute little robot rocking up to the gate of their house. They wanted to know, will a customer actually go go out to the gate to fetch their pizza instead of having a guy or a gal knock on the door? And the answer is yes. Um, maybe it's because robots are still so new and such a novelty for most people. But robot vision is very important. And if you think about the spatial databases that governments and other organizations collect, there's also a lot of information that can be used to help these robots navigate. Domino's is doing some really interesting things. They also have a drone where they're doing drone-based pizza delivery in Auckland, New Zealand as a trial. So there's some cool stuff happening on the technology front in terms of taking this and bringing it down to a consumer interactive service. 
Now, one of the things that will happen is that vehicles which are armed with all kinds of sensors will not only be communicating back to some database somewhere, they'll be communicating with each other in vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle networks and with the cloud-based network traffic control system that will also be communicating with infrastructure like traffic lights and speed limit signs. So today, when you've got a driverless car, it uses robot vision to figure out how fast or slow to go. In the near future, this signage will be telling the robot the speed limit here is X. The street light will say, I'm about to turn to red in 10 seconds. And the robot car will be able to calculate exactly what it needs to do next. These will also play a role in visions of self-repairing cities. So at the University of Leeds, one of their ideas is that rather than having dedicated robots scour the streets, why not use the robot vision in all these vehicles that are going to be across the streets and let the cars tell us when they detect a road that is in need of repair, and that will be our trigger for doing a little robot repair work that may be like a little bit of 3D printer type of work. There are so many opportunities in this space, and once again, there's going to be some sort of network and analytics that goes with this. And it's not just the driverless aspect, it's also the infotainment aspect of connected cars. Once again, this is a space that telcos could play in, but you've got to remember when you've got vehicles traveling at velocity that can hit each other or pedestrians, you can't have a network failure. It really does need to be very robust, and part of that will be having sensors on board these robots as well as the robust traffic control system. So what might this look like? Let me just give you a cheeky view from Black Sheep Productions of what this autonomous vehicle world There are already researchers working on slot-based vehicle systems. How do you, though, slot when humans are going to walk in front of a car? I think it's the human factor that will continue to present the biggest challenge. We're going to see lots of drones in our environment, and they will be armed with all kinds of cameras and doing all sorts of things. You know, there's already drone videography for real estate. One of the interesting things that I've seen are insurance companies using drones to do assessment after a flood or a fire. There are also drones that are being used for rescue. Um, this one in the center is really interesting. It's shaped like a beach ball, so if you go into a disaster zone, instead of crashing um, into something that might be out hanging because, you know, there's been an earthquake. It'll just bounce off like a beach ball. In the utility space, drones are being used for asset inspection of things like utility networks and also of cell towers. You know, again, it's something that's expensive to do and, you know, there are safety issues for humans. There's also an experiment in America with Verizon doing a drone management system in conjunction with NASA to be able to track drones using sensors on their cell tower. So this is a space that's going to be fascinating. And with the recent relaxation in drone rules, both in Australia and in America, we're going to start to see all kinds of commercial operators offering drones as a service. In the world of agriculture, this is going to be absolutely huge. The sensors that are deployed on agriculture drones at least some of them that I've seen, can generate up to a gigabit per second worth of sensor data. Combine it with cloud analytics, for instance, weather predictions, and you can start to do some really interesting things. Drones is a service that I think is very interesting for telcos. There's also another um, recent announcement in the telco space from Nokia. They're using drones to deploy little tiny flying pico cells to give enhanced coverage when there's a special event or in the case of a disaster. This was announced just about a month ago, and they're doing trials in Inverness in Scotland of deploying these pico cells that can get um, bandwidth of up to 150 megabits per second. 
Nokia is also doing experiments in the Netherlands with UAV systems, um, unmanned aerial vehicles, another name for drones, to be able to do drone traffic management. And indeed, I believe that we're going to see highways in the sky and the same kinds of vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications networks that we'll need for autonomous cars will also need it to do drone management. In the US, Amazon has put forward a proposal to segment airspace, and it's something that NASA is looking at very, very um, diligently, and having different kinds of drones with different equipage classes at different heights. So if you've got a drone that has a lot of sensors and it's fully autonomous and it's fast, maybe flying up to 120 kilometers an hour, it would fly between 200 and 400 feet. Whereas a manual controlled drone that has less sensors and maybe line of sight vision would fly below 200 feet. There's going to be a whole lot of work in this in the coming years. Much like we've got standards for telecommunications networks, we're going to start to see traffic management standards for our highways in the sky. You can't really talk about robots and all these advanced technologies without also mentioning artificial intelligence. And whenever I hear the term AI, I always think futuristic technology. But in fact, work on AI started all the way back in the 1950s with expert systems. And what they did in the early days of AI was they tried to mimic in programming code the decision trees that experts would make. And those systems were very narrow and very rigid. That started to change in the 1990s with the development of neural networks and what we're now calling cognitive computing or learning systems. One of the big milestones was in 1997 when IBM's deep blue computer beat the world reigning chess champion Garry Kasparov. A lot of how IBM did that was through a lot of computational power. But that continued to evolve. In 2011, when IBM Watson won Jeopardy, what they had designed was an AI that was able to react to natural phrases. So you're starting to see AIs that are able to interact in human language rather than in pre-programmed language. Earlier this year, 2016, Google's DeepMind division beat the world reigning Go champion. And that AI, called AlphaGo, is said to have exhibited creativity in that it took actions that were not trained into it. So with today's AIs or cognitive systems, the way that you train them is not by programming them, it's by feeding them masses of data. So you feed it your databases, whether they're structured or unstructured. You feed them Word documents. You feed them YouTube videos. You feed them social media. All kinds of things go into these AIs, and they absorb this, and they learn. So one of the areas where we're going to see AIs first is in the fintech world with so-called robo-advisors. And unlike this picture, they're not really hardware robots. They're soft bots. So in the world of fintech, there are already a whole range of firms that have deployed these automated investment services that allow people to manage their portfolios with a better rate of return than a human advisor would give them on a completely autonomous basis. Now, AIs will not, use just, uh, not be used just in an autonomous fashion. Another really interesting example is what I would call assistive intelligence. And an example is from IBM Watson, where they're partnering with oncologists to be able to have the AI, Watson-based AI, comb through reams of data on cancer that are being produced in clinical trials around the world, papers that are presented at conferences, all kinds of new drug trials, and match it with individual patient records and provide to a trained oncologist information relevant to the treatment of a particular patient. Because let's face it, there's so much data coming out that no matter how trained a surgeon is, they can't possibly keep up with everything that's happening all around the world every single day.
Another example of this assistive intelligence is with a law firm in the UK that's a bankruptcy specialist. They have an AI called Ross that is able to read through thousands of documents pertaining to bankruptcy and get to the knit of what happened and then present it to the lawyers. And it greatly reduces cost and time in bankruptcy proceedings. We're going to see a lot more of this and it's not um, necessarily going to um, save the jobs of people who are doing just compliance work. So if you've got, for instance, an accounting firm and all you're doing is compliance and filing tax returns, it's time to actually lift your value proposition and start doing something that actually provides more value to your clients. Or you might find that they can do an AI-based service that's going to do it cheaper and faster and more accurate than a human could do. Another area where AI is making huge advances is in the area of voice recognition. In the late 2000s, we started to see the emergence of search-based apps like Google Now and Siri that were able to react to human voice commands and do searches and act in a very rudimentary way, like maybe sending a text or scheduling a meeting. That changed a few years ago with Amazon's Alexa AI. Now, with Alexa, what you have is a combination of AI that's voice controlled and a hardware device called Echo that is for smart homes, and it's a combination of speaker and microphone. And what's cool about what Amazon did was they opened up their API so that third parties could interface into this. And that's what made Alexa really valuable because they have in the order of 3,000 partners. So you can do things like say, Alexa, turn my lights off or on. Okay, that's fine, that's home automation. But what about Alexa, order me an Uber, I need to go to the airport. Or Alexa, I'd like a Domino's pizza, pepperoni please or what a telco um, in Australia recently did, Megaport, um, they did an experiment where they said, Alexa, I'd like to dial up a virtual connection at 300 meg for this Amazon server, and they had a voice control. Now, you probably wouldn't use Alexa for that in the real world, but it's an interesting experiment in the telco space. A couple of weeks ago, Amazon, I'm sorry, Google did a whole range of announcements, and one of the things that Google came out with was Google Assistant, which is an even smarter, if you like, interface into this world of artificial intelligence digital assistants. And what Google Assist is able to do is remember things. So you could say, Google Assist, remember my bicycle lock combination, and five years from now, it will remember your bicycle lock combination for you. And it has conversational actions where you might say, Google, I'd like to find out when the cheapest flights are in October to go for a weekend in Vegas. And it'll come back and ask you a question. Well, do you want to go nonstop or is it okay to do you know, a non-direct flight? And ask you some other questions and then ultimately make your reservation. This is a new paradigm of digital assistance that's going to be both um, an interesting opportunity and potential threat for different telco organizations. There's also privacy implications. You know, how much do you want a social media giant like Google or Amazon or some others to know about you? So what might these digital assistants look like? Let me just show you a short little clip. This is a company called um, Chimera Systems and they've been working on this space for a number of years now. The other day I had a meeting downtown and MagnaRail went offline. Nigel learned about it and booked a car service so I could make my next appointment on time. This week we had a meeting with a brand new client. Nigel never stopped mining the industry data and new services and was able to provide us with the latest numbers for our presentation. And you know what? We rocked it and earned the contract. So what's interesting about this is that it's drawing information not just from your personal treasure trove of information, but from all sorts of sensors that are deployed in a smart city. It looks at your calendar and it does things that actually help you navigate your life. Their view is that you should have a personal cloud and a personal AI rather than a public cloud with an organization like Google knowing about it. So the question will be, is this an area that telcos can play in? A few years ago, I was talking to the head of Bell Labs, Marcus Weldon, 
And his view is that it is absolutely an area ripe for telcos. And when I spoke to him at the time, they were working on a Project X, which would actually be a cloud-based AI system that telcos could deploy for digital assistance for their customers. So I think it's a watch this space and see what happens. But by the year 2020, it's going to be very common for us to have our own personal digital assistants of some stripe. Another area that's fascinating is robots as a service. So I mentioned drones as a service earlier. How many of you have heard of Pepper? Anybody? This is Pepper, this absolutely cute little humanoid robot. And it's deployed by SoftBank in Japan. SoftBank is a major telco. And what they've done is in conjunction with a robotics company called Aldebaran, they've designed this little robot that is able to have a conversation with people and picks up emotions from people based on their facial expressions and the cadence of their voice. Now, they've put peppers up for sale once a month for the last 12 months. They put 1,000 units up. And every single time, these robots have sold out in one minute flat. And their plan for this is they sell the hardware, they sell a three-year subscription for software updates to the robot, and a three-year maintenance plan. Pepper is now powered by IBM Watson, so Pepper is about to start getting smarter and learn more. And companies are deploying Peppers in their storefronts as well and using them to greet customers. It's an interesting space and one that's right for the picking for the telco market. Now, with all these emerging opportunities, you know, there are so many new areas that telcos could, could get into, but there are also risks to your reputation that you could find um, are threatening your very existence if you don't get it right. And when I say get it right, it's not just in the new technologies, it's in your basic core connectivity. And I have to look no further than my own home country of Australia for a couple of catastrophic examples of telcos who recently have not gotten it right. In 2009, um, Vodafone Australia and Hutchison did a merger, and by combining their networks, they were meant to have better capacity, and it ended up being a total disaster. They were just completely caught out by the data tsunami, and between 2010 and 2013, they lost two million customers, and they ended up being sued by consumers and earned this nickname, Vodafail, that after now, billions of dollars of investment later, they're still finally starting to shake, although they had a network outage about three weeks ago, which brought up this whole Vodafail again. In the meantime, Telstra, which is the former incumbent in Australia, has a reputation for having the best you know, networks, premium quality, premium price, and over the last number of months, they've had a range of catastrophic failures. They've blamed routers, they've blamed software upgrades, they've blamed human configurer. But I don't think that's actually the full story. I think that there might be some capacity issues behind it. And in fact, one of their failures happened at the end of our financial year on 30th of June. And I was in a department store, Meyer on that day, and every single system was out in the company. They could not take credit cards or FPOS or anything else. The only way that people could do transactions was to pay cash. They couldn't even let you order through their online system and have it shipped to you because the online systems were down. And in fact, I was talking to one of the salespeople, and they said, well, we're actually going to miss our year-end targets because of this. Jetstar Airways was grounded because of this outage, and it impacted banks as well. You know, so these kinds of outages can be very, very serious. Throw this in the mix with autonomous vehicles and real-time robots, and you can imagine that the circumstances are going to go really serious if you're in those spaces and you have a network outage. There's also a risk um, of governments imposing more and more restrictions on the telco space. In Australia, they've passed a law called mandatory data retention where telcos are being forced to save metadata from all kinds of communications modalities for a period of two years. So they're not just being told to collect this information and hand it off to the government, they're being told to store it in this big aggregated honeypots on their infrastructure. And I think it's ripe for 
hacking. I mean, there's so much information that can be used and abused. And it's meant to be a thwart for terrorism. However, there's scope creep that's happening as well, where um, the occupational safety hazard organizations want warrantless access to this data, where racing commissioners, you know, horse races want warrantless access to this information. And there are big costs to doing this. And of course, there are privacy issues as well. And then we have Yahoo, you know, the data breach, 500 million email addresses and accounts and passwords that were breached. And the breach happened in 2014, or according to some reports, maybe even 2012. And one of the questions that people have is, when did Yahoo know about this, and why have they only told people about it now? And then a few weeks after the breach was told, we found that they had actually written code to spy on the NSA and were spying on people's email. Wow. You know, Verizon had just done a deal for $4.83 billion US to buy Yahoo, and now that deal is being jeopardized. But you know, it's not just breaches. We are sending so much information in the cloud. It just astounds me how much information put out there, people put out there about themselves. This word cloud is something that I built um, a few weeks ago from the 98 data points that Facebook says it collects about people. And it is just astounding how much these social media giants know and how quickly they change their terms of service. So what does that mean for us as humans? You know, with all this technology and sensors, you know, are we still going to be human in the coming years? And you know, what about implants and other things that we might take into our bodies? How might this evolve? Well, there's already work being done on implants um, in the medical world to help improve human memory when you've got people with Alzheimer's or dementia. But DARPA in the United States is looking at these same technologies to augment soldiers' memory. There are people that I know that already have RFID chips inserted in their metal carpal areas between their thumb or NFC chips, and they're using it to store information. There's work being done at DARPA where they're looking to be able to go right into a soldier's nervous system and be able to control pain and be able to control emotion, say, from post-traumatic stress. That gives a whole new meaning to employer knowing information about you. And one of the things that I think about is, well, if your employer has put an implant in your body, what happens when your tour of duty is over? Who owns that implant and what might they do with it? So in the future, in the 2030s, people like Ray Kurzweil believe that we will actually have interfaces directly into our brain in our neocortex. Little tiny DNA printed robots that are injected into the capillaries of our brain and connect us wirelessly into the internet. Imagine that you think you want to send an email to someone, you compose it in your head and off it goes. Ever push a send button too fast? This gives a whole nother meaning to it. If you ever have used Google to search something, imagine thinking that you want to know an answer to something and it's automatically executed. If you need more processing power, instead of spinning up an Amazon core, you spin up the extra processing in the cloud and suddenly you've got superhuman computing capabilities. You download a skill. Now, all of this goes to what does it mean to be human and where's the dividing line between you and the cloud? And what happens if that information gets hacked or if someone hacks into your brain? What are you going to do, a reset and wipe your brain? I don't think so. It also gives new meaning to network connectivity. Imagine how naked you'd feel if suddenly, you know, you're used to having everything on tap just by thinking and it's gone. Wow, that would just be an absolute disaster if there were a network failure in that far future um, realm. So coming back to the here and now, you know, there are so many opportunities for telcos in the world of emerging technology. And I wanted to paint a picture of a few of those emerging opportunities for today. And I'd like to thank Subex for inviting me to share my view of the future. Now, having a, a partner ecosystem, I think, is going to be essential to moving forward and to staying on top of the crest. And I hope you have a very good conference. Thank you very much.
You're not allowed to leave the stage yet, Shara. Oh, I'm sure there's okay. going to be lots of questions coming in. I have a few already that have come okay. in. But those of you who haven't already logged on, please go to pollev.com forward slash subex. You can leave questions for Shara there. You can also do it the old-fashioned way. But with these lights being so bright, I probably can't see you. So make <laughs> sure you put up your hands really high and you grab a microphone. Now, we've already got a couple of questions okay. come in whilst you were speaking. And one of them is quite um, really focused on the analysis of where we are as a business. So the question that was asked is, over the next 10 years on a global level, which regions will see the most revenue growth and which the most capital investment in networks. So I guess that's talking about telco okay. investment and revenue yeah. growth. Oh, look, that's a huge question. And, you know, in terms of regions, I won't pick a particular geography, but what I would say is that regions that have only low-speed connectivity or big regions or geographic swaths with no connectivity, that's where you're going to need the most investment to be able to put things out there. But in many ways, that's actually an advantage because you'll be able to use newer technology like 4G or 5G or some of these other um, technologies like MBIoT, rather than having to upgrade existing systems. In the developed world, where we already have very high mobile densification, we're going to see the need for that densification continue to increase. And we're also going to see investment not only just in putting in new cells and more fiber, but in upgrading the network capacity to have more backhaul at base stations and upgrade to the next generation of technology. So the investment is really multi-pronged. And you know, I'd say the developed, developing areas, because they're not dealing with the legacy in some geographies, actually have an advantage. OK, great. Thank you. Another question here for you, which is uh, about network neutrality. That's something that a lot of people oh. get very upset about. You, people talk about risks, but other people see it as a great thing. It's a big political issue. Where do you stand? Is it going to hurt the people in the room, network neutrality? Mm -hmm. Might it help them? It's interesting. Um, no, it's funny because in Australia, network neutrality hasn't been a very huge issue because the networks have been largely neutral. We don't have these same vested interests that you would have in the United States. But I think network neutrality does need to be there because you're going to have competitors going across your networks and you don't want to find suddenly that you're excluding what turns out to be the biggest next thing from your network because you have a stance on network neutrality where you're going to give less um, priority to packets that come from, let's say, an IoT network that's not your IoT network, you might find yourself really marginalized if you take that approach. Another question that's come in whilst we're speaking there, are we becoming more vulnerable and inviting strangers to our with things like smart homes, oh. what is your view? So threats about the, in, oh, look, the internet of things. Yeah, look, security is such a huge issue and privacy, wow, I, I can't say enough about those two issues. One of the things that really worries me is that almost every emerging technology that I look at, security ends up being an afterthought. You know, as it's being developed, privacy is an afterthought, ethics is an afterthought, and I think that we need to really educate the public that you've got to look at security and privacy before you buy these gadgets. And I really worry about some of the data that's being collected by huge social media giants and how they are constantly changing their terms of conditions to be able to use information that when we signed up to a service was meant to be secure and isolated, let's say from their advertising area, suddenly our most personal data is being used in ways that we didn't envisage or initially give permission to. And these agreements are click wrapped. You either accept it or you don't. And most people don't even read the full terms and conditions. I don't think that most people actually understand how much they're putting out there. And identity theft is a big risk, you know, and it's it's a risk for organizations too, because a lot of times telcos and banks and others actually underwrite the risk of fraud that goes across their network. So yeah, it's huge. Well, I, I think you know when you mentioned there about reading the terms and conditions, I saw a survey said that the few people who did read it on average spent less than 90 seconds going yeah. through it, which tells you they're not really reading it. But of course, the, the thing now is with the internet 
of things, there's going to be devices that don't even have a screen. So when they change yes. the terms and conditions, how is the interaction even going yeah, to take and, place? And even worse on some of these IoT devices is that they've put in um, the compiled code. They don't even have the source code for their security. And there's no mechanism for upgrading the security on the thing that's doing something. And how do you combat a new threat when you've got no opportunity to even modify the code. You know, so security is going to be huge. And as we start taking more and more sensor data, you know, whether it's in your house or in a city or on a train, and using it to base real world actions like maintenance or lack of maintenance, well, you know, there's some pretty catastrophic things that can happen. Absolutely. Do we have any questions from the floor? We don't have to always do it the newfangled way. People can use a microphone and ask a question. Any hands up? I can't see any hands. Oh, here's a hand up. Okay. Do we have a microphone, please? Whilst I'm fetching a microphone, I will ask you this one that's okay. coming again. Do you really think it's up to people to protect themselves? Where does the book stop, says Rohit? Where's Rohit? <laughs> there we go. He's taking yeah. responsibility for that question. Yeah, and you know, I think for those of us that are technologically literate, then we really do need to look out for ourselves and try to spread the word amongst the people that we influence. But so many people don't have that kind of deep knowledge to even know what to look for. You know, if I think of, you know, an 80-year-old mom or grandmom, you know, who is only now getting to grips with a smartphone, do you really expect someone who's just learning how to use the technology to also be aware of these security threats? Mm. So I think that as service providers and experts in the industry, we also have a responsibility yeah. to protect people who don't know that they even have to protect themselves. They just we're, don't know. We're we tend to be quite good at protecting ourselves with the lawyers. Sometimes we're not thinking about how to help people protect themselves and That's make right. their life easier. And I think that there's also opportunities for telcos to become the pr trusted privacy advocate to basically say to your customers, we're the ones who are going to put together your personal cloud, and we promise you you know, forever and a day, for as long as you're part of this service, that no third parties get access to your data, including us, unless you specifically give permission for third party access, maybe for a period of time. For instance, if you're in the process of buying a house and you want real estate agents to know that you're looking at particular properties, there are particular fields or data segments that they might have permission to look at, but then you can revoke it or only give that permission to specific real estate mm. agent companies that you want to. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Mm. But you know, if you had a big company that actually acted as the savior and protector of the citizens, I think people, once they realize how much information can be abused, will want that kind of service and will want to feel protected. Yeah, and we see that a little bit in terms of how Apple responded to the FBI request. Oh, absolutely. You know? yeah. There's actually some value, and sometimes the telcos get criticized by politicians with the, with the, with the accusation that you're only doing it for competitive market reasons, which yes. to me sounds like you're doing it because people want you to do it. Yes. And the, the, not, they don't put it so nicely, the politicians. Now, we had a question from the floor. Yes. Uh, Sharad, thank you for showing us the future. You know, it, it's really scary. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I probably don't belong to that generation where, you know, I don't have to use my brain. I belong to this generation where I'm start, you know, I see this evolution happen. Uh, you know, whenever I see these future technologies, you know, it makes me really scary. Uh, but, you know, whenever I see this, you know, one thing that reminds me, you know, uh, I was a kid, you know, and, uh, you know, during, you know, uh, the famous rivalry between Pete Sampras and Andre Agassi, the Agassiz team has said that, you know, we have worked out everything about Sampras. The next time, you know, Agassi meets, uh, you know, Pete Sampras is going to lose. We know Agassi is fully prepared. Uh, you know, it's everybody's guess who's won it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of Pete Sampras. So Pete Sampras leads, leads 20, 30, 40. I'm sorry, which one was this? Uh, I'm saying that, you know, Pete Sampras uh, leads Andrea Agassi in all time, you know. Uh, rivalries. So, uh, you know, it's it's really uh, interesting to see, you know, how these, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the technology has grown, you know, much farther. But you know, I would still f uh, believe that you know the human, te you know, intelligence always will uh, have, uh, you know, some advantages over these artificial intelligences. Uh, but you know, having said that, you know, the technology has come uh, much further. 
uh, I really feel scared, you know, when, you know, some of these uh, are going to invade our personal life uh, yeah. and our brains, you know, our, you know, uh, you know, biometrics. You know, I am really scared, you know, when I see, that, you know, I don't want to give my left hand thumb impression, you know, to my phone, even yeah. for accessing it. So, you know, the future technology is going to be absolutely scary for the kids. Well, yeah, I well, especially if we have implants in our bodies and those implants connect directly to the net and who knows who might be able to tap into that data stream. You know, there are actually thoughts that everything that we see and hear and feel and experience will be recorded and stored in a cloud somewhere, you know, for our own personal use, but who else might get access to it? And frankly, I worry about the privacy aspects and sometimes I also worry about what does it mean to really be human? Well, I mean, one thing I was going to ask you, and also this is very relevant for people in the room, uh, in terms of technology versus human intelligence, you talked a little bit in your talk about uh, augmentation, you know, yes. and augmented reality, and how that's used to train people to do their work. So that's a great example of or technology helping a human yes, being assistive. to do a job. There's also the potential, of course, that the technology replaces the human being, and that was a little bit with the, the robot Pepper, which might be a replacement for some people in their line of work. How do you see the future? Do you think that we're going to, in the end, be replacing people at the jobs, or are we going to help them do their job better? Which I is think it's going to be trend? both, and I think it depends on what kind of jobs we're doing. So if someone said to me that they drive any kind of vehicle for a living, I'd be very worried about their future. You know, I'd say maximum you know, in most parts of the world, 10 years, and you better start reskilling before that. The thing that happens with technology is that it's now at an exponential rate of change. You know, it's going like this, and people are going to find that they've got advanced degrees, let's say, in finance and accounting, and they're in white collar jobs, and they thought they had a secure future, or they're a lawyer. And suddenly the jobs that they're used to doing, which were highly paid, you know, and you know, highly specialized, now can be done faster and cheaper mm. by an AI. Yeah. And we need to make sure people, both skilled and unskilled, are trained in some of these new modalities so that as these new jobs, and there'll be many come online, they've got the right skill sets to take advantage of it. But I think that our societies could have a bit of a big problem in that intervening gap between people who've been used to working their whole lives, suddenly being displaced by technology and a gap between the displacement time and when they're reskilled, if ever, on a different area. You know, and it's especially dangerous, if you like, for unskilled labor who yep. aren't technologically literate and don't have that sort of formal rigor. Yep. However, there are areas where personality and creativity is going to be a new job category of the future. So, if I take the example of digital avatars, well, you don't necessarily want to have a stock standard computer voice as your interface. You will have people that do personality design for digital avatars, yep. you know, yeah. and they'll do yeah. voice recordings for these digital avatars. You know, it'll be a whole new field. Lots of new opportunities. Yeah, but if people don't know that those new opportunities are on the horizon, how are they going to train mm, or even sure. figure out who do I talk to about doing this? You know, so you might have people that drive for a living that have a huge personality and they'd be perfect for that yeah. but if they don't know about that what's going to happen yeah absolutely now <laughs> i appreciate there's been more questions coming through i'm sorry to say we don't have any more time and i'm going to gonna hang out for the rest of the day so but yes go to shara i think i would love to continue the conversation oh it's fun unfortunately we've got the rest of the conference to do which is going to interrupt a little bit but i know i'm going to be grabbing you and picking your brains later on please another warm round of applause for shara Evans. thank you everybody Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Sarah.